shut up and enjoy the ride. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. Thank you for what you're doing in our town and all that you're going to do. We ask of you to take charge of this service and come do our bidding. Without you, it's just a mess. And with you, all things are possible. I ask of you, Lord God, to lead, guide, and direct my brother Jim. God, anoint his lips with coals of fire straight from your mouth. Help us to learn, Lord God, not just to hear your word, Well, first of all, thank you for coming out on a Wednesday night, and uh, we just finished up our series on uh, how to respond to the promises, and th this is not a, a long teaching, uh, maybe a couple weeks, uh, maybe two. I want to keep it fresh on our mind. Uh, Even though we talked about the promises and how to respond to them and do all, all, all of that, another layer of it or something that we uh, possibly don't labor enough or possibly we don't uh, trust enough. I'm not sure what the all the factors involved are, but in this day and age, I really think that it's very important that not only how to respond to the promises of God and all that he has done for us, but we need to start learning, uh, teaching ourselves how to enter, truly enter his rest and how important it is to enter his rest and start trusting God with every area of your life and to get rid of the concept that entering his rest means that entering his rest does not mean that we do nothing, that God has done it all, he's, everything is finished, and we just need to do nothing. And that's the furthest thing from the truth because the enemy would love that more than anything for you to just leave everything up to God when God has left everything up to you. He's given you a free will. He's giving you authority. He's giving you everything, commanded you to go ye into the world and, and share the gospel and to be a light into the world, told you to do all these things. And then you're going to sit back and you say, well, I'm just going to enter his rest. And that's not what it means. So I want to try to get a good, clear understanding of what it is to enter his rest. How do we know that we're entering his rest? And uh, that's kind of where we'll, where we'll go tonight. Probably won't be real long. I usually don't when I, when I introduce something new. And the scripture I want, and, and instead of saying enter his rest, uh, I, I wrote down a few few statements. And how to obtain or receive what's already been done or made available by faith versus, I'm going to say this twice, versus using your faith to get God to do something he's already done. Okay? So let me read that again. How to obtain or receive what's already been done or made available by faith versus using your faith to get God to do something he's already done. And that's kind of a contrast, and, and it's two, th those, that statement is it's two different things. So we're going to start, and we're gonna, our scriptures that we're going to start with all day or all this evening, they're going to start in Hebrews 4, and it starts Hebrews 4 and verse 1. And we'll go through these kind of one by one by one. It says, therefore, since a promise remains, now remember, this is the, this is the New Testament. This is not Old, Old Testament teaching. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, at least any of you seem to have come short of it. Now, the word fear here, what do you, what do you, I know I said one of my, one of my goals that I put forth. 
at, at our last, uh, what would you call it, leadership meeting, I guess. Anyways, one of my goals was to somehow to get more involvement. So with that scripture, why? what application do you think that fear would, would be? What kind of fear is he talking about? Okay, he says there remains a promise, okay? And, you know, the original promise was to the Israelites. They were, because they were to enter the, God spoke. So, see, we're going by God's spoken word when he gives us a promise. Here, he was given a promise to the Israelites. He says, go possess the land. But they did not enter that rest that he had for them because of the obstacles in the way, that, which they should have ignored, but and hung on to what God told them. In other words, God said, go possess it. They should have went and possessed it, but they had all these excuses of why they couldn't. So he says, therefore, since they didn't enter the rest, a, no, there's another promise that we can enter a rest. So what would the fear part be? What do you think the fear part would be? Be afraid or, or be fearful that you can miss everything that God has for you. By not entering the rest. You see, they didn't enter the rest, the Israelites. So he's saying, be fearful that you can miss out on so much that God has for you if you don't do this. If you don't enter his rest. I, I'll, I, I'm going to keep this in hand here. It says, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest. So here's the promise. All of you now can enter his rest, okay? You can all enter his rest. Let us fear, at least any of you seem to have come short of it. In other words, don't miss out on it. Don't, don't not enter his rest because of unbelief. Don't not enter his rest like the Israelites. They missed out on so much they could have had, and all they had to do was believe what God had said and go do it. So God is telling you right here, there's a promise of a rest that remains for my people. And don't, don't miss out on it. All right, go, go to verse 2. Let's we'll kind of slide our way through these. For indeed the gospel. Now, remember, what is the gospel? What, what is the, in a nutshell, what does the gospel mean in, in the New Testament? Gospel. It was a new word. It really was only used hardly ever until, until Jesus came. The gospel was the good news. Right. So the good news was preached to us, but there was good news that was preached to the Israelites. The good news was Jesus or God was saying to the Israelites, I've got some good news for you. Go enter my rest. So he's saying, for indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Well, there was a few who had faith. Who, who were them few? that entered who was the few that had faith what God told them and they entered the rest Jacob and huh Caleb and Joshua see they heard the word they had faith they could care less about the giants and all that they're like God said go get it we're gonna go get it all right so what he's what he's saying here in a nutshell is I've got this promise my word the gospel I'm preaching you this gospel and there, there's there's some there's a factor involved and it's called faith it's believing something that that you can't see that you you, know, you don't know you know uh, but what you have to know or what you need to know is is that he said it so uh it's important that we learn how to enter enter uh enter his rest uh i had I'm going to rely on my notes a little bit tonight. I haven't done this in quite a long while as far as this, this teaching. Um, along with Hebrews 4, Hebrews 4 1 is uh, the fear part is we don't want to miss out on it. Uh, fear is used to be cautious, be aware, be diligent, not to miss out on the provisions already made available to you. Be diligent to take advantage of the provisions. Don't let it pass you by. And then, uh, you know, the, the, the being pro proclaimed. How many have heard the message, the gospel message? 
the, the gospel. Remember, the gospel message is the good news. We have to get, you know, uh, understanding the concept of the gospel. Uh, never been done before. In all, all the creation, all the thousands of years, something new was happening. This was all new to people. That we were going to be taken out of the equation as far as receiving, as far as getting, as far as being able to operate. Uh, everything, th the good news was this isn't about what you can do. This isn't about what what you have to achieve. This is all about you trusting this good news, this gospel news, trusting that if you will surrender to him and trust him, he's going to give you this this gift for your salvation when you all received your salvation what did it cost you nothing what does the, what does the word tell us about how how do we receive this this free gift what what's our part in it to receive the gift of salvation i believe it's titus 2 he says the the grace of, of salvation has been it's been given to all men it's been it's been given so what do we got to do to receive it? What's our part? What's our part? Come on, help me out. Huh? Believe. So in other words, in other words Jesus says, I got this great news. Right. He's saying if you want it, it it's free. It's not going to cost you anything, but there's something you must do. There, there is a part we have, and, it, and it's the believe part. And then once you do surrender your life, then it's the trusting part. And, you know, religion has always told us and taught us that uh, everything that you get is, is, is earned. In other words, if I'll pray more, if I'll do this more, if I'll do this more, is it, is it beneficial to play more, pray more? Absolutely. Is it, is it I mean, pr in prayer, prayer is communicating with it's not long drawn out. It's not proper word use. When you pray, you're just you're just taking time out of your day to talk to your heavenly Father. It's conversation. You can pause and you can listen. It's just it's just open and there's no set guidelines and rules of how long. But there should be a line of communication between you and and if you're going to get to know someone, you got to communicate. And that's all, that's all prayer is. Titus 2.11, what does it say? Oh, don't let it go. I missed out on it. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So why aren't all men saved? Why isn't everybody jumping on the, on the bandwagon? If the grace of God, and what's the grace? What, what's grace? I mean, if, if this scripture says the grace of God has brought salvation to all men, what's grace? Come on, people. Yeah, right. Undeserved. Un it's, it, and the best way to do grace is learn the mercy part. So uh, people say, what's the difference between grace and mercy? Okay, so here you go. It's the best way I know to tell you. Mercy, God's mercy is not receiving what you do deserve, right? In other words, his mercy is you deserve this, but you're not going to get it. That's his mercy. And then grace is receiving what you don't deserve. Those are polar opposites. People say grace and mercy go hand in hand, and they kind of do, but they mean two different things. His mercy is not receiving what was due to you. So that's his mercy saying, okay, Hunter, this is what you deserve, but my mercy says no. You don't. My mercy is going to take care. No, I'm not going to do it because my mercy. And then grace is you saying, Receiving everything that God has for you, all of the, his goodness, his blessings, his, his healing, his, his provision, his, his abundance, everything that he's got for you. And all you have to do is receive it, and you don't deserve it. So, yeah, but grace is undeserved, merited favor of God. You didn't earn it, you don't deserve it, but it's yours. And then mercy is, yeah, you deserve this, but I'm not going to do it. So he's saying the grace, his grace, which is nothing to do with you, 
You have really no part on it, but my grace has made it available. Salvation is through that. And my, my point was, what's your part? It's just it's receiving it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I surrender my life. I give it. I want, I want everything you've got for me. And it's not about it's not based on goodness, or he would it wouldn't be grace. If you had to earn it, if you had some part in it, then it wouldn't be grace. And it would not be free. A free gift is a free gift. Your part of a free gift is to what? It's to take it. It's to receive it. Yeah, and the enemy, he wants you to think that that you don't deserve it or, you know, you fall short and all that. And you're like, you could tell him, yeah, I may, that may be true. But it, it doesn't line up with his, with his word because grace takes care of that. And, you know, uh, I believe it starts in about Hebrews chapter 8 and around verse 7. I'm, I, this is not on the on the notes but it's where he says that the holy spirit under this new new covenant when we when we surrender our lives and we're filled with the holy spirit that it will teach us and lead us and guide us and that we won't need our neighbor to tell us that, that we'll know from the inside he'll be our teacher uh that's the part that will change you that that trusting the the, the leading of the holy spirit and you know and i've done this before but uh I'll use Christian as a as an example here. I'm gonna pick on him a little bit, but uh, if you if you was to sin or whatever, you're not happy about it, are you? You're not like, oh, I'm glad I did that. I mean, how many Christians really that love God that have surrendered their life? They go do something they know they're not supposed to do, get all excited and happy. Boy, I'm sure glad I went and did that, man. We're not. Now, if you are happy and you are glad and you're like, boy, I can't wait to do that again, you got something wrong. There's no conviction there. Because if, you know, if, if, if he says if your heart condemns you, it's you because he's not condemning us, but there's a, there's a convicting part. I believe if you're born again and you have any kind of relationship with the Almighty, you know when you're not being very pleasing to God. You know it. And guess what? He's made a provision for that, hasn't he? Yeah, he's made a provision for that. He has put the sin on him, and he has taken care of it. His blood has taken care of it. He has made a way. But it's when, you're, when your conscience becomes seared and you no longer feel guilty for your actions, that's when you're headed for trouble. That is when you're, with, but as long as you're being convicted and, and the Holy Spirit is dealing with you and, and, and you can never be an overcomer unless you overcome things. And we'll overcome things our whole life. I mean, it may be as simple as a, as a quick temper or a bad attitude or, or maybe you're a gossiper. You just can't help to, to, to tell things to people when you know you're not supposed to. These things like that, you know, people say, well, you know, those are, the, actually they're unspoken sins. You know, and they do a lot of damage, but the Holy Spirit can change you from the inside and, and, and do such a wonderful job. But it involves, it, it involves trusting Him. And uh, it ha the Holy Spirit has a way of removing things as you stay attached to Jesus. And, and instead, instead of, you know, when you, when you sin or you fail, Instead of running from him, run to him and say, Lord, I, you know, I messed up. Forgive me. You know, together we can overcome this. I'm going to stay attached to you. I need you. And do a work in me. And, you know, together we will overcome this. But, man, it's that process because we are the hardest on ourselves. We're the ones that feel we're not deserving of his forgiveness. But you have to forgive yourself. We're the ones that say, you know, I just, man, uh, how could God love me? Well, because his word says he does. How does he love you? Unconditionally. There's no, there's no limit on his love for you. He doesn't one day get up and say, you know what, Stephen? I'm just done with you. No. He never gives up on his love for you. Never. It doesn't end. It's an everlasting, unconditional love. He loves you. 
So don't ever feel like you're, that, that he can't love you. And because he loves you, he wants the best for you. You know how you know he wants the best for you? Because he sent his best for you. He sent his best for you because of his love for you. And he knew that his son would take care of whatever was owed to you. But you've got to trust that process. Uh, so now let's look back to the entering his rest. Okay, right, Hebrews 3. We'll just work this thing out a little bit. For we who have believed, here we go. Somehow this believing thing has something. By golly, there's something to this believing, isn't there? For we who believed do enter that rest, as he has said. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundations of the world. Wow. It was a done deal, and they just didn't go get it. And guess what? It's a done deal now. Who made it a done deal? Jesus. When a lawyer says, I rest my case, is it because he's tired? Or is it, or is it because he's, it's done? There is no more that needs to be said. So Jesus said, sat down at the right hand of the Father and did what? Oh, he said, he, he sat down. There was no reason. He, he, he was time for the for the. For the six days that God created, everything was done, wasn't it? And then man entered when everything was done, and then he rested. All right? We're at a point in time when, when 2 Corinthians 5.17 came along. When that happened, it's not on my notes. When 2 Corinthians 5.17 happened, New people walked the planet that had never walked before because the Holy Spirit used to come upon people in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit could, 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 could you know, be around somebody. But when 2 Corinthians 5.17 happened, new people walked the planet of the earth that had never walked before. On a day of Pentecost, when the fire came down from heaven, Something happened that had never happened before. Men were filled with the Spirit of God. They were a new creation that had never walked the planet before. A new covenant was established. A new way to do things was established. And in Hebrews 8, if you start at Hebrews 8 and 1 and you read through the whole thing, he tells you that that, that established a, a new way w that we operate. That's all about the new covenant. And you go to Hebrews 8, 1, it lays it all out. That if the, so therefore, if anyone is in Christ, how many are in Christ? How many have received Jesus Christ as their, as their Lord and Savior? Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. Confession is made unto salvation. Okay? He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, some things have become new. Huh? All things. Hmm. And that stands true every morning when you get up. I think it was Paul who says, I die daily. How many remember that? Paul says, I die daily. What does he mean he dies daily? Brother Court, help me out. What's Paul mean? He's laying, he's that, that old guy that happened yesterday. I'm getting up in the morning. Today's a new day. Whatever happened like yesterday, I'm forgiven of it. I can walk in, in, in his righteousness because he's made me that way. And that's what I'm going to say. Because I died. I died daily. He, lay, he, he just, you know, he, he dies daily. And that only takes place because we're new, we are a new creation. Now, uh, one of the hardest parts about entering his rest, uh, let's just continue on. We'll just keep going through the, what was that, three? Go to four? Or was that five? Four. We, finish, we just finished up with three? Okay, so we go to four. Uh, let's see here. For he has spoken in a certain place on the seventh day in this way. 
And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Can we keep going in Hebrews 4, 5? And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest, since they didn't, since therefore it remains that some must enter it. And those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. And then, I think we're going to seven. Yeah. And again, he designates in a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice and do not harden your hearts, and this is a continuation, for if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. Now, this is like 400 years later that David's saying this. I think it's around 400 years. So why would David make that statement? Because there remains a rest. There remains a promise of a rest, but who has to enter that rest? Who is it that must enter that rest? Tiny, you got to enter it. I can't do it for you. God is not going to make you enter his rest, but his word says, enter my rest. Enter my rest. And then, then he also says, it's labor to enter his rest. Well, what's the labor part? What would be the labor part? Because as soon as you say, God, I'm going to enter your rest, I'm going to trust you, by faith, I'm going to stand on your word, I know the circumstances, I know the giants in the land are there, but your word says this, by faith, I'm going to stand on that, I'm not going to look at the circumstances, I'm not going to worry about how I feel, I'm going to look at God's word, and I'm going to trust you, and the, the minute you do that, the enemy will hit you from all sides. He will put in your head. He will attack your body. He will attack your what you're hearing, what you're seeing, your circumstances. He will, he will try to change and get you off so you won't enter his rest. Because God, when you're at rest, God goes to work. When you're meddling, he stands back and says, well... You've got my word. You've got, by faith, you can speak my word. You've done your part. You spoke your words. You stand your ground. You're going to trust me. I'll send my peace while you're going through the process. And then the enemy is going to hit you with barrages. And that's when you stand and you, and you say, no. His supernatural word, his supernatural seed will produce fruit if I will not back down. I'm not backing off the word. I don't care what you hit me with. Send the enemy packing. I'm going to enter his rest, and when you enter his rest, he goes to work, and he makes a way where there is no way. When you start calling those things that are not as though they are, when you start speaking God's word, you'll get hit with the enemy, but you don't back down because as soon as you back down and get off of it, Satan is one. You're not in his rest. Now you're, you're, now you're confused, and now you're not at peace. He has stolen your joy because you've left his rest. And he says, I don't care about the giants in the land. I don't care how big they are. I don't care how big the armies are. My word says do this, and if you'll do what my word says and stand on it and enter my rest like the Israelites were promised, I can go to work. And I will say that again. If you go to work and try to meddle and, and, and make things happen, then God backs off. You're going to do exactly what Abraham and Sarah did when you start meddling. God said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. He didn't say you two are going to come up with a plan and do it. There was no plan B. He said, I'm going to make you, the, you will be the father of many nations. That was the supernatural seed. He spoke it. You will become. But guess who meddled? Abraham and Sarah meddled. And look what happened. If they'd have just stood firm and said, you know what? He said we're going to be it. We're going to be it. Right? He doesn't need your help. What he needs you to do is to speak his word, right? And then when you speak his word, you don't back down. To enter his rest. And 
Yeah, and, and when the enemy hits you, you, you go back to the Word. Go back to the Word. That's always your source. Because, Hebrew, yeah, Hebrews 4.12 says the Word of God is quick and powerful and sh sharper than any weapon or sword you may get. And it pierces through the division of soul, joints, marrow, and spirit, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. His Word does all of that. And it really does. But the key is when you enter his rest to believe what he says. You know, that's the thing is they, the Israelites were given. You got to remember when, when God spoke to them and told them to go in and, and possess. He said, go possess the land. Right. He didn't say go possess the land unless there's giants in it. Go possess the land unless there's big arm, you know. He just said, he, in other words, he doesn't lay out all the scenarios. He says, go possess the land. The obstacles are irrelevant. See, and that's what Caleb and J Joshua knew. They're like, man, they're like, they're nothing to, to God. He said, go possess it. We're going to go possess it. Okay, if he says something in here, you need to take it at what he says and you're not basing it on your feelings. You're not basing it on, you know, and it's kind of like the, 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 you know, we're to love the Lord that God with all our heart and all our mind and our soul and our neighbor as ourselves. And we're to love as Jesus loves. We're to love, we're, that's, we're, we're told to do that. Well, actually, we're commanded to do that. And all the things he could have commanded us to do, that's the one he th thing he did, right? So if somebody hurts you with, with words or wh for whatever, that would involve your feelings, wouldn't it? But see, we're not basing our response to that individual by our feelings. We're basing it our response to that person or how we're going to deal with that person through God's word. And if God's word says you're to love that person, it says love your enemies, those who spitefully use you, those that stab you in the back, and, and, and we're to love that person. And when you do that, Okay, Lord, I'm going to need help, kind of like the disciples when, when he said, how many times do we forgive our brother? And he said, seven times, seven. In other words, you're going to forgive him when he, what? And they're like, Lord, increase our faith. Right? So, Lord, increase my faith. I'm going to love you even though you did me wrong. And when you love them, when they do you wrong, it releases you from it. The peace will come in, and now you've turned it over to God, and he will do a much better job of dealing with that person than you. He doesn't want you to get involved. He wants you to, to love that person. You may be the only thing that, that, that stands between him and him and, or her in salvation. In getting their, I mean, your ultimate goal is no matter how bad of a person they are, you would love for them to be saved. I mean, that's, that's truly the ultimate gift, and and. People in the world are looking at us. Do we get mad? Or do we say, okay, I'm, I'm not going to react based on how I feel. I'm going to rea react based on the love that I should have for that person. Now, remember, in Romans 5, 5, it says, when you are born again, when you are saved, that the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. The love of God is shed abroad in your heart. So it's, it's there. It always is there. So, you know, when you're feeling that way, uh, you know, when a person's really getting under your skin, how many got people that get under your skin? Come on, we all do, right? And you can say, Tiny, you can say, you know what? When I got saved, the love of God was poured in my heart. It was shed there. And, Lord, I want you to help me to love this person because I, I know it's a supernatural love that the world doesn't have. You have the ability to love Unlike the world, because it's a supernatural love that only comes through the Holy Spirit that he put in you. That's another part of what makes you special is that is that love that he's put there. So with the you know, this is yeah, kind of an introduction that we may only go a couple of weeks. Uh, I, I kind of need to cut it just a little bit short tonight, but uh, study all you can on entering his rest and huh? Verse 9, there remains therefore a rest for who? Them who are born again. Those who are, There is a rest for every one of us here. How many would love to enter God's rest and trust him and say, you know what? Uh, 
Did you know that, that worrying will not make you any taller? That's what the Bible says. Do you know that? Oh, it says you won't, it won't make your stature. It won't raise uh, one, one, one statue. Yeah. It won't make you any taller. Uh, yeah. Wor- worry is is a uh, it's just it's faith in the wrong direction. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so when the when the when the going gets tough. And the the world feels like it's closing in. Don't look look to the word, you know, and and say to yourself when it when it when it looks like it's getting that you don't belong to this earthly kingdom. This is not your home. You're only passing through, and your main job is to be a light into the world. And to show the love of God, in other words, when people are in your presence, there should be a noticeable difference of who lives inside of you. You shouldn't have to tell them, I'm a Christian. If they're around you long enough, they should know there's something different about you without you telling them you're a Christian. The things that come out of your mouth, you're always positive. There's a, there's a, they feel different when they're around you. There's there's there should be a tangible evidence. In fact, the disciples said, how will they know that we're, you know, th- th- that we're your disciples? And he says, by, by your love for one another, by the way that you love each other. The world don't love like, should not love like, like we love. Yeah. But you shouldn't have to tell them, you know. And, and uh, yeah. Uh, Yeah, there's a uh, there's a light. I call it a light, a sw- like a switch in every Christian's life. At some point in their life, if they sh- hang on to their to their salvation and don't reject God, that one day you go from from being uh, from being a, a a from being a Christian to all of a sudden, it becomes who you are. It's just who you are. It's not something you do. Like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm a, like you said on Sundays, whatever. It's being a Christian is something you do, and then one day, it just becomes who you are. It's so. It's just you don't. It's second nature that it's who you are now. There is no set aside time for for this and that. It becomes who you are. You arrange your day. You know things. You, your life is 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 it's who you are, and once you hit that point, that's that's when you, uh, I think you can really become an effective uh, warrior for for God. That that you've you've matured enough, and it, it's who you are now. You know, it's not something you do. When I mean, being a Christian is something you do, that light switch hadn't went off because one day it just consumes you, and it says it becomes who you are. And I think that's a good thing. So uh, we'll pick up next next week. Uh, have a blessed rest of the week. Uh, I know we really need rain bad, but we got rain coming in tomorrow. The ground is cracked and dry. We had got no rain. We need some more rain, right? Yeah. We got rain coming. Uh, I love you guys. And uh, just, just get us get us next week.